you if you would just lead us in prayer to start off. You know how we need to receive and and ask the Lord. I'm just already telling her what to you pray. You are just praying. No, no, no. I, I, I get tired of hearing my voice. I like other voices. But I really do want to be corrected if I'm wrong. Yeah. Thank you, God, for this night. Thank you for this yes. opportunity. Thank you for everyone that's here. I pray that you would open our hearts Thank to receive you, your truth, God. Yes. Pray that you would just anoint Mom with wisdom, give her the grace to teach this lesson, yes. show her things she's never seen before. Mm -hmm. Lord, if there's anything that's not of you that she's heard from tradition, God, right. that you would just stop that up, that she would speak your truth and speak it with authority yes. and anointing. And I thank you, God, mm. that you are just opening our eyes to see your truth. Any Hallelujah. blinders we have on you would remove those in Jesus' name. Any pride that rises up, yes. you would show us, Lord, Ooh, that we would discern that that was not you, but that was the enemy. Thank and I you, thank Lord. you, God, that we are going to have revelation, yes. signs, and wonders tonight Ooh. in Jesus' in name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody said amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. And if the rain comes in, they're not planning for storms, they say. It'll be okay if it rains a little bit under here. We've got music up here, so at the end, we're going to play some music and have a time of prayer. If anybody wants to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're a Christian already, but maybe you, I don't see, I don't know who has, who hasn't, we'll pray over you. And I believe it can be just like that. Now, the, the backdrop for this is when we came to Walnut Cove, I felt the call to Walnut Cove as long ago as 1996, but I didn't answer the call for a lot of years. I was a woman. I didn't know if women were supposed to preach or whatever. Studied it out and realized they can. So, uh, but I, I didn't really want to, if you want to know the truth. I was running from it. But I kept feeling the Lord send me to Walnut Cove, go to Walnut Cove. We were going to church in Winston, but I kept hearing, go to back to Walnut Cove, my hometown. And I heard preach this. And I realized, I thought about this a lot today. You got churches all over town. There's a many a good church in this town. We fellowship with them. We love them. Um, so you didn't need it. They didn't need another church in Walnut Cove. There's plenty. But you don't have a church in the town limits right now that I know of that's preaching this. And this is biblical. For some reason, and I knew this when God first called me to Walnut Cove in the late 90s, and I didn't answer the call, as I said. I knew that there had been some kind of like a almost a demonic stoppage in Walnut Cove of anything that has to do with this subject, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is the moving of God's Spirit the way it moved in Acts chapter 2 and beyond in the New Testament. I could feel it. You had a town like King. I love King. My ancestors are from there. You got a town like King that's got seven or eight churches that preach this. No problem. But you, in Wanna Cove, any time a ministry tried to move into this realm, persecution rose up. And none of them made it. They all shut the doors after a little while. To my knowledge, as I said earlier, I don't know of anybody else in town right now preaching this. So we've got to keep preaching it. And I'm going to preach the whole gospel. But I know that God told me specifically, focus on this. Make this a regular part of our ministry. Because again, Walnut Cove didn't just need another church. They got plenty. They needed somebody preaching this. It's controversial. I'm just going to tell you right now, it should not be. But I want you to think about this. If you were the devil and you wanted to really stop the church after Jesus, you know, died, rose again, ascended into heaven, sent back the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. If you were the devil and you really wanted to stop a move of God, it's obvious what you're going to do. You're going to try to take the move of the Spirit out of the church. You're going to try to think of anything you can to fool people into saying, we don't need this anymore. We, we really don't need to go there anymore. And we're going to talk later about some of the arguments that people may bring up to you. If you say anything to them like, yeah, I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're going to hear sometimes arguments, we don't argue. I'm not going to argue. I'm going to love everybody, but I am going to speak scripturally what I believe God has revealed here in these papers that, uh, and this is not just me, people all over the world believe what's in these papers. But I understand what the devil's tried to do to rip this out of the church. That's why sometimes you get a backlash when you do try to teach this because it is a teaching that almost disappeared from the church over the centuries. It didn't disappear. There was always a remnant of people moving in this kind of power and anointing. But the, the main teaching of it was robbed from the church as a whole. It's coming back now. The fastest growing, I hate to say denomination, maybe that's not the right word. The fastest growing type of church in the world is the Pentecostal church. 
which is teaching this. And that's the fastest one. It's exploding all over the world. So what we're doing tonight is we're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to talk about the prophecies that, of what was coming in the New with Jesus. Then we're going to go to the New Testament, tell you what Jesus said about it. Then we're going to talk about what was said after Jesus had ascended and sent back the Holy Spirit. And um, we're not going to get into as much what you might read in 1 Corinthians 14. I throw that out there because if you're taking notes or somebody might watch later, that's something good to study. We'll talk about that next week. 1 Corinthians 14 tells how the gift of tongues is to be used in a church service. That is a different thing from you just being baptized in the Holy Ghost and having your own private prayer language with the Lord. It's a different thing. Now tonight, if you have questions about that, we can go into it a little later. But for now, let's look at this. All right, page one. If you don't have one, Abigail's got them in the back. What does the word spirit mean exactly? In the Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew originally. In Hebrew, it means this, and I love this. It means wind. It means breath. And when you talk about breath, it means either just a barely sensible breath, like, like you just barely feel it if you blew on your arm, or it can mean a violent exhalation. Like, so spirit can be just a gentle moving, a gently moving thing, or just a whoosh, like that rushing mighty wind. So that is what the word, in Hebrew, it's ruach. It also <coughs> means life. Do you see? I'm passionate about this subject. Do you see why the devil tried to rob this from the church? Because this is the life of the church. You know, Jesus' love and his blood is what makes it all possible. But this is where the life came in. Now, that word ruach came from another Hebrew word. On your paper, you're going to look at it and go, wait a minute, that's spelled the same way. It's pronounced a little differently, but it's close. And it meant properly to blow, to breathe. But look at that last thing it means, to make of quick understanding. That's important because the spirit is not just there to make you feel chill bumps or to run and jump and shout and praise God. It's there to make your understanding better. And that's what the word originally meant. Now, in the New Testament, it's written in Greek. And there the word is pneuma. Does anybody see something that reminds you of? Pneumonia, yes, because that's where pneumonia comes from, this same root. Because pneumonia has to do with the lungs, has to do with breath. So pneuma, spirit in the New Testament, is just that. It's breath. And I'm going to throw out that if anybody else is getting cold, because I understand we have blankets, Malachi, why don't you go bring out a stack just in case anybody gets needs them, because it may start to cool down a little. Okay, let's talk about some examples of the spirit in the Old Testament. Now, remember this, the Holy Spirit, the way we know in the New Testament, had not yet been poured out. That could not happen until Jesus ascended. He said that. We'll read that later. But the Spirit of God was still there. The Spirit of God was moving from creation. The Spirit of God moved even at creation. You know, it hovered whew, over the earth during creation. So the Spirit was there, but it's a little different from the way we experience it now. At that point, to my knowledge, and if, if I'm wrong, somebody please correct me. I, I will receive correction if you can prove it biblically. I'm with you. It seems to me that in the Old Testament, the Spirit was something that could just come to you, move upon you, and then, you know, go back. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, when it was poured out, it becomes resident in us. It abides in us. It doesn't go anywhere. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and go out and backslide and become a terrible sinner. The Holy Ghost doesn't go anywhere. The Holy Spirit is still within you. It may not be operating the way it should be because you are in sin, but it doesn't go anywhere. So I want to clarify that when you're talking Old Testament here. This is not all the examples of the Spirit, but here are a few. Joseph. I've put the scriptures that you can study more at home, and this makes a great Bible study for you privately. Genesis 48, 31. Just put them anywhere in a chair back there, buddy. It's okay. If you get cold, go grab y'all one. Genesis 48, 41, 38 says that Joseph was a man in whom the Spirit of God is. He was a man who moved and listened to the Spirit of God. Number two, Bezalel of the tribe of Judah. Exodus 31, 3 says this about him. 
And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. Here's something interesting. He was not some preacher or something. He was an artisan. He was, a, he was an artist. He was a craftsman. And God wanted the people who were going to design the tabernacle. This was when Moses was putting together the tabernacle before the temple was built. God wanted the people who were designing that to have his spirit moving within them. So this is an artist. So the singers, you know, the player, the people who play instruments, the artists, literally, the artists like Brittany and Elijah and whoever else, the Spirit of God can move in that. We used to go to conferences sometimes and they would have artists with, uh, you know, canvases and they'd be painting during the sermon. And at first I was like, that is so disrespectful. You know, why are they doing that? No, they were paying attention, but as the Spirit would move, they might paint while the sermon was going forth. So there's an example of that in the Old Testament. Number three, you have Balaam. Numbers 24, 2 says that the Spirit of God came upon him, and when it did, he prophesied and he praised God when the Spirit came upon him. Number four, Joshua. Numbers 27, 18 says that Joshua was a man in whom is the Spirit. Remember that this is the man that God told Moses, lay your hands on him and let him take charge once you're gone. So it was important that he listened to the Spirit of God. Number five, and I don't speak fluent Hebrew, so I don't know how to pronounce all these just exactly. It's like Othniel. Judges 3.10 says this about Othniel. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. Now when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went out to war, he won that thing. I mean, he won the war because the Spirit of God gave him that power to go in and to have wisdom of how to fight the battle. Number six was Gideon. Most of y'all have heard of Gideon. Judges 6.34 says, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and when it did, that's when he blew that trumpet and gathered the people to go to battle. And, of course, that was a success as well. Number seven, King Saul. 1 Samuel 10.6 Saul prophesied when the Spirit of God came upon him. And here's what's interesting. King Saul was already not really a very holy man at that time. You know, King Saul was the one they chose for the king. God said, anoint him. But then he started going the wrong way. But when the Spirit of God came upon him, he prophesied. Now, I'm throwing that out to tell you this. Just because you see somebody that you think you just don't agree with everything they believe or maybe they're not living just right, doesn't mean that the Spirit of God can't still move upon them when they come into an anointing. I used to be, I'm confessing right now, I used to be judgmental about this. My church in Winston, man, when the Holy Ghost broke out, it broke out. People running, jumping, shouting. Never saw a holy roller, but I mean, it could have happened. I just didn't see it, but they, I mean, the Spirit moved. And I would see people that I knew good and well were not living the moral standard that I was. I'm telling you, I'm rep I've repented already. And I'd see them come in there and the Holy Ghost would start moving. The choir would get to singing and the Holy Ghost moving. And I'd see those people take off running around the church under the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'd be like, hmm, I don't know about that. Is that real? I don't know because they're not living in the right life. You can't judge that. Anybody can come under the power of the Holy Ghost and it move upon them. It's not dependent on you living a perfect holy life that the Holy Ghost moves upon you. And we'll talk more about that later, too. Now, number eight, Job 33, 4 says, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. It tells us there that it was the Spirit of God that made us. And when he breathed into Adam, whew, that was his spirit. He breathed his spirit into Adam. That's such a beautiful thing when you, when you really think about it. Number nine. Isaiah 59, 19 says this, When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Some versions say it will raise up a standard against him. So that tells you right there that when the enemy's trying to attack, the Spirit of God is there to raise up a standard. It is so key for us to be moving in the things of the Spirit of God. Now, those are examples in the Old Testament. Next part. And if I'm flying through this too fast and you have a question, please raise your hand. It's a lot of material, so I am trying to zip through it. Old Testament prophecy of the New Testament outpouring of the Spirit. 
In other words, when is it talked about in the Old Testament what was going to happen one day? Number one, Isaiah 32, 15 to 18. Until the Spirit, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to need a bottle of water. I can feel it sometimes. It's dust <coughs> under this tent. Thank you, Abigail. Sorry, y'all, but there's dust under this tent, and when the wind blows, sometimes it stirs it up, and I have to start drinking. Isaiah 32, 15 to 18. I'm only going to read that little part. It's not all the verses. <coughs> Excuse me, but you can go read those at home to, to fill in the gaps. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, things can't happen. But later it says, what's in parentheses here, what does happen when the Spirit is poured upon us from on high? <coughs> it makes the wilderness fruitful. It brings righteousness and peace. It brings quietness and assurance. Who doesn't need that? Anybody need quietness and rest and peace and assurance? Thank you, Abigail. <coughs> that is what the Spirit of God does for you. It is such a beautiful thing. All right, number two. Ezekiel, chapter 11. And I have to read all these for the sake of the camera for who can't be here. Ezekiel 11, 19 to 20. God's prophecy said, I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. What he's saying there is, I gave them the law on tablets of stone with Moses and all, and it never works. They just can't keep it. They have, you know, they keep breaking the law. They don't know what I'm requiring of them, really. But he said, I'm going to give them my spirit. And I'm going to put it on not tablets of stone anymore, but the fleshly tables of their hearts. And then they're going to know. They're just going to feel, God wouldn't want me to do this. Or God wouldn't want me to say that. So he was going to make it all different now because the spirit would be inside of us, giving us the law of how to live on the inside instead of tablets of stone. <coughs> Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, is a, almost a repeat of what I just said. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Once you get the spirit. It really is easier. Now, am I telling you that once you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're never going to mess up? I'm not telling you that. I've, I have many times since I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you this, though. I, I just I had such trouble even trying to live right before that. I just had trouble. Not everybody does, but I did. I was a teenager. I was trying to live right, and I kept backsliding. I tried until I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And that brought me this power and anointing that even living right was easier. Didn't mean I didn't mess up. It just meant it was easier. It was, I had something inside me giving me that strength and power. All right, oh, here's my favorite from the Old Testament. Joel 2.28, number four, Joel 2.28 says this. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. This was a prophecy of what was coming one day to say, I'm going to pour it out. And when I do, they're going to start having spiritual dreams and they're going to start prophesying. And, and notice in that scripture, it's everybody. It's not just the guys or not just the gals. It's not just the old people or just the young people. It's not just the black people, the white people. It's everybody. He said, I'm going to pour my spirit on all flesh. Oh, and that's what's getting ready to happen when we go to the New Testament. Now, at the bottom of that page, before you turn to page two, this is a quote I took from Andrew Womack's book. Anybody know Andrew Womack? Some of y'all have heard of him, Bible teacher. He's got a TV show. <clears throat> I agree with him on this. He said, the sad truth is that denial of the Holy Spirit is a convenient theology. Believing that miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit don't operate today excuses powerless living. The number one reason people resist the ministry of the Holy Spirit 
is because it exposes the lack of power in their lives. And once exposed, it demands a change. In an attempt to avoid responsibility for change, they change the scriptures instead of themselves. I'm telling you what, y'all, that gets me when I read that, and I agree with him. All right, page two. Before we get into the New Testament, it is crucial that we understand that the word receive, for example, in the New Testament, they'll ask sometimes, the apostles would say, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? It's important that we realize the word receive, we're here in English. We hear receive, 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 receive. It's the same word. It wasn't the same word in the Greek. If you go get a Strong's Concordance, and I recommend a, that's a great thing for all Christians to have or use online. If you look at the word receive, it has a few different meanings in Greek. And I have put two of the most important ones here when we talk about receiving the Holy Ghost. The first receive, and if you wonder what that GK is, that means in the Greek, in Strong's Concordance, it is number 1209, 1209, if you want to look it up. And if anybody's got revelation on this that you're feeling while we talk about it, stop me and let's hear it. The first receive is dekomai. That is a more passive verb. It's not a real active one. And I'm going to give you an example in just a minute. It's as if someone comes to you with something that you just take. Something's been offered to you and you accept it, okay? Let's say that I just go up to Kayla here and I say, here you go. Okay? She took those. She didn't really have to do anything. You see what I did? I offered those to her. In fact, just put your hand out, Kayla. Okay? I'm just going to say, here you go. She received, didn't she? I mean, those were in her hand. She received, but that's the word dekomai, which means she didn't have to do much. I just kind of handed it to her. Um, when you get married, well, I don't know. They do it differently these days. Back in the day when you got married, you went to the back of the church. You know what I'm talking about? You go to the back of the church, and everybody files out and shakes your hand or says, congratulations. Oh, I'm so glad you got married. And when they do that, you are, you are receiving they're congratulations. You're not having to do a thing except receive them. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's decomite. But there's another one that when you're talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, this one's key. It's the Greek word lambano. And for the sake of the camera here, in the Strong's Concordance, it's the Greek word that is defined in number 2983. 2983, lambano. It is a very active verb, unlike the other one. It means that you take it, that you get hold of it, that you accept it, that you attain it, that you catch it, that you have it. Look at that last word. I didn't make this up. This is what it means in the Greek. You seize it. Now, if Caleb put her hand back out, remember what I did a while ago. Here is the decomai. I just put it in her hand. She didn't have to do much. I grab it out of my hand. Okay, I'm a big bean girl. Come on, grab it, grab it. <laughs> now that's Lombano right there. She she grabbed it. I did not even put it in her hand. She just grabbed it. That's Lombano. That is that active verb that means I'm gonna take hold of it. I'm gonna grab it. I'm gonna seize it. And in the Bible, when it says you get saved, it says, and we're gonna read the scriptures in a minute. But it, I'm, I'm making it easy here. When you get saved and you receive the word of God, it's the verb dekomai. You receive the word of God down into you. In other words, there's no works that has to be done to get saved. Salvation is really simple. When you believe in the Lord, you turn from your sins, you know, you repent and, and he saves you. You believe in him. You're going to say you're going to follow him. You just receive that. Salvation is so beautiful. You just dekomai. But the receiving the Holy Ghost, lambano, is something you just grab and you take it's a little bit more violent almost not in a bad way don't don't get me wrong not in a bad way and now let's go to the scriptures that use these words decamai and lambano <clears throat> the promise of the holy ghost in the new testament and now we're going to read what jesus said about it as well as some of the apostles number one matthew three eleven. john the baptist is baptizing everybody in water. By the way, we're going to have a baptism soon. If anybody wants to get baptized, we keep adding numbers almost daily if people want to get baptized, and that's great news. Let me know. But here's John the Baptist baptizing people, and he says, 
I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. He was preparing the way for Jesus. He's saying, I'm putting you down in water right now, but somebody's coming that's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And it wasn't just Matthew that wrote about this. On your paper, you'll see that I have got Mark, Mark 1 8, Luke 3 16, John 1 33. Every one of the four Gospels wrote something very similar to this that Jesus was going to be the Holy Ghost baptizer. Now, let's look at that word baptize. I had a lady years ago, um, she might have been a little irritated with me, but she said, why do you always call it the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Baptism is just water. Why do you call it the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I said, baptism is not just water. Because it uses the word baptize in what I just read to you in Matthew. So let's look at that word, baptize. Baptizo in Greek. Sounds about like it does in English. It means to immerse. It means to totally cover you. To immerse, to submerge, to overwhelm. So when you're talking about he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, it means he's going to totally immerse you in the Holy Ghost. He's going to just overwhelm you with the Holy Ghost. It's going to be more than just, well, okay, yeah, I got saved and I allowed Jesus to come into my heart, you know, into my gut area here. But it's, I read an example one time that says it's like if you invite somebody into your house, if some, one of y'all, you've never been to my house, right? I keep using Kayla. You're on the front row. Sorry. But if she came to my house, I might invite her in and she just sits in my living room. I doubt she's going to get up and go to my refrigerator and go start getting milk out or juice. or She's welcome to, but she's probably not going to. I doubt she's going to walk in my bedroom and just start looking around or hop into bed and cover up. Because I invited her into my house and she's there. But she's not going through the whole house. You see where I'm going with this? The Holy Ghost. It's like when the Holy Ghost totally baptizes you, everything gets taken over by him. He's not just sitting in the living room anymore. He's in your refrigerator. He's in your bedroom. He might even be in your bathroom. He's everywhere. So that's got just a little worldly example to show you what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is like. He takes over. He, he overwhelms you in a good way. Example number two of the promise of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. Luke 11, 9 through 13. Luke 11, 9 through 13 says, And I say unto you, Jesus is talking here, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, I think this, this verse set of verses is very important because... I've had people who've come to me privately and said, nobody here, if they're watching, I'm not telling you names. Um, they've come to me and said, I'm scared to ask for the baptism of the Holy Ghost because what if I get something that's not the Holy Ghost? What if it's something else, evil? This scripture plainly tells you that if you ask your father, I mean, if Wyatt and Cooper come to Chris and say, Daddy, can I have a piece of bread? He's not going to go pick up a rock and say, yeah, here, kid, eat it. <laughs> That's not what a, an earthly dad would do. So God is saying, if an earthly dad wouldn't do that, why do you think God's going to do that? If you ask for the Holy Spirit, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. But I do now, when somebody asks me to pray for them, to receive the Holy Spirit, I didn't used to do this and I've repented. I ask you now, are you a Christian? Do you know Jesus? Have you made that decision? Have you repented of your sins? Because we have some biblical examples of people who wanted the power of the Holy Ghost without really being a Christian. And in that case, you know, who, I don't know what could happen if somebody asked. But for Christians, it's a gift. It's for us. And it's a beautiful gift. Number three, John 4, 23 and 24. John 4, 23 and 24 says, But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Y'all, it is so important. A lot of churches are preaching pretty good truth, but if they've left out the spirit, something crucial is missing. God is looking, he's searching for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. You got some people who move so much, they say, I'm so much in the spirit, I can't be bothered with what the Bible says. I just listen to God talking to me. Uh, wait a minute. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. We worship him in spirit and in truth. We got to have the written word and the spoken word. You can't go to one extreme and leave one out because then you're, something's wrong. And we'll probably get more into that later. Uh, number five. No, number four. John 7, 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus comes into town during a feast, Feast of Tabernacles. We celebrate that here every year. He comes into town and he tells them, if you're thirsty, come to me. I've got water. You're never going to thirst again. Come to me. And the, it tells us here in parentheses, notice. Now, the writers probably didn't put it in parentheses. The translators did. They're saying he was talking about the Holy Ghost. You know, when he said that to them, he was talking about the Holy Ghost, which had not yet been given. Remember, they, they could operate through the Spirit, even in the Old Testament, but the Holy Ghost, as we know it now, had not yet been given, it said, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. In other words, he has to die and be raised again and ascend into heaven before he can pour back out his Spirit on his people. He had to go through that before it could happen. Does that make sense? Again, stop me if you got a question. Well, I just I always like to yes. out there that it says they that believe on him should receive that that to me that's very clear like that's your only qualification if you're a believer then you should receive the holy ghost that's it yes they that believe on him should receive because you have a lot of people who think i'm just not ready for that or i'm not worthy i'm not living holy enough you know i'm not ready to receive the spirit but if you are a believer yes. you believe on him then you should receive it that's yes. It lays it out so clearly there, I think. I'm so glad you said that. I had never noticed that. And maybe a year or two ago, my daughter, Chelsea, Chelsea, my daughter, she said to me, look at this. And she explained what she just said. And I'm like, never noticed that. Those that believe should receive. You don't have to be real sanctified, real holy. That's a teaching. That's a false, I'm going to call it out. There's a false teaching in some a Pentecostal type churches today that you got to be sanctified before you can receive the Holy Ghost. You got to be living a certain way. I've seen people praying at the altar to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and seen people say, now if you would just take that jewelry off, you probably could receive. Could you be more sanctified if you weren't wearing jewelry and all that makeup and stuff? What? That's baloney. I just called it out. I did. Y'all proud of me. I just called it out. That is baloney. We got to call out false teaching. Thank you. I saw a little applause over there from your son. I like that. All right. So let's keep going. This is so good. Number five, John 14, 16 to 18. Jesus is talking still, and he says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus coming back to you. I've had people argue with me and say, but wait a minute, there's the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost? I know. I can't explain it either. I wish I could. I keep waiting on Megan to study that out. She's been studying that. I'm like, study that out. Tell us how it works. I'll the rest of my life. I'll be honest about it. I mean, the, the oneness of God, the mystery of godliness, how do we explain it? Father, Son, Holy Ghost, they have just some different functions, but yet they're all one. So Jesus said, clearly, you can't argue this, I don't think. Jesus said, I'm getting ready to go away, y'all, but don't worry. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to come to you. I'm coming back to you as the Spirit. And he plainly says here, he said, 
I'm dwelling with you now, but I will be in you. So people of God, if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus and everything he ever was and did flowing through you in a powerful way. And again, more on that later. And now number six continues with that theme of the comforter. John 14, 26 says, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is the comforter is in us, it's here to teach us everything we need to know because God knows everything. And if God is inside you, he can teach you everything you need to know. I think we limit. I think we limit that sometimes, and we should not. Number seven, John 20, 22. And when he, Jesus, had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. There's a receive. And it's that word lombano, which means, y'all, go after it. Go for it. Now, some people argue and say, but he gave them the Holy Spirit right then. Well, if he did, how do you explain what we're getting ready to go to in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2? And you'll understand that more when we read the scriptures. I believe, basically, he was simply instructing them, knowing he was going away, that once he was gone, go after that promise that I told you I'm going to send back to you. Y'all go for it. To put it in modern words, and that's a paraphrase, it may not be correct, but it's the way I see it. Okay, number eight. This is starting, I'm sorry, yeah, Acts chapter one. This, let's see. Yep, this is still Jesus talking here. This is Acts chapter one. We're going to read verses four and five and then jump to verse eight. He was getting ready to go back to heaven, y'all, getting ready to ascend, and here they are gathered. And being assembled together with them, commanded them. Somebody say commanded them. Commanded them. This is not a suggestion or saying, well, if you're Pentecostal, do this or charismatic. Do. He commanded them, his followers. He said, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, you've heard of me. In other words, Jesus is saying, I, I already told you all about this. The comforter is coming. But don't depart till you receive it. Verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8 is one of my favorites in the whole Bible. But you shall receive power when? Somebody tell me. After. That next word. Look at it. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, when I told you that Jesus breathed on them, we just read that, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. That proves to you in Acts chapter 1 that they, they had not received it yet. Because in Acts chapter 1, he says, Wait for it. Don't y'all leave. Think about this. They've been with Jesus, a lot of them, three and a half years. They've seen the dead raised. They may have raised the dead. Did they raise the dead? Do we have an uh, They probably did. He sent them out, and he told them. When he sent them out, he said, raise the dead, heal the sick, you know, cast out devils. They've been doing this stuff. You would think that they had everything they needed already, but evidently not. They were doing that because he was with them, and he was giving them the power while he was there to go do it. But he's leaving so he's telling them, don't leave Jerusalem. In other words, it would have been real easy for people who had been doing all this stuff. They've been casting out devils and doing it all. It would have been real easy for them to say, okay, okay, y'all. When he's gone, we're going to take off to the world and spread this message. And that sounds good. But it, that's what he said. He said, wait till you be endued with power. Till you have received that Holy Ghost. He said, you're going to have that power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then, you see the order. You wait until the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And then, he says, then you go out. He starts with Jerusalem, which is just right there. It's where they are. And then he says, you're going to go out to Judea. You're going to broaden it. And then you're going to go to Samaria. And then you're going to go to the whole world. 
And you see what I put at the bottom? This is something that I really firmly, obviously I believe it. I put it on your paper and put my name on it. So I lay claim to this is what I believe. Modern churches as a rule, not all of them, are putting the cart before the horse. They're trying to minister and witness effectively without having first experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which brings power for effective ministry. Jesus gave his followers the correct order in Acts 1.8. Now, as a disclaimer, because man, have I had people get mad at me when I say that. I'm not saying that if you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, that you can't be a great witness. You can be, my mother was baptized in the Holy Ghost June the 2nd, 2002, maybe, something like that. My mama had been a Christian since she was maybe 10. Did you get baptized when you were something like that, 8 or 10? She was a Christian, and trust me, she was a good witness. She raised me. My mama was a very good witness. All we're saying here is that there is something that can come to you to make you an even more effective witness. Wouldn't you want to be a more effective witness? My mama can tell you that when she was baptized in the Holy Ghost, I don't even know how old she was. She, she was grown up. I was grown up and married. She was a grandma. But she'll tell you something changed in her when that happened. She'd been a witness all along. She'd been a Christian all along. But some power rose up in her that night that's never gone away. And y'all better watch out if my mama prays for you. Because uh, it's probably going to happen when she lays hands on you. So do you understand what I'm saying? I we are, Say it, Chels. A really a good visual image that helped me when I read scripture is that, and it's not one of the ones that was on here, but it's in Luke where it talks about, you know, he told them, wait till you be endued with power. And that word for endued there literally means to be clothed. Ooh, I love so that. It means to, to sink into a garment. So like, you know, I have this jacket right here, this sweater. It's my sweater. It belongs to me. I already have it. But it's different from me holding on to this sweater that's mine and from me actually putting it on. That's good. So that, possessing yeah, possessing it. That's good. Whether it's completely enveloping me and clothe, you know, clothing me such a good example. So that word endued in the Greek means to literally put on a yes. garment. So that to me kind of shows the difference there. Yeah, do y'all see that? I mean, if she's getting cold right now, and again, I'm going to say it again, please get a blanket. Don't suffer. Go get a blanket. Cover up. But I didn't know it was going to be this cold tonight. Sorry. She That's helping her some, that sweater. But it's going to help her more if she puts it on. When she puts that thing on and is endued with that sweater, and dude, with that power, there's a difference. Thank you, Chelsea. I really like that. All right, here we go. Page three. The reality of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. This is where it gets even more exciting. Number one, Acts chapter two, one through four. Jesus has now ascended into heaven. He told them to wait, right? He did not tell them how long they were going to have to wait. It could have been one day could have been a year. He didn't tell them. To my knowledge, we don't know. It's not biblical that he told them. They don't know. So they go to the upper room somewhere, and there was 120 of them, it says in there. They go to the upper room, and they start waiting. Now, I don't think they were ordering pizza, and, you know, I think they were, I think they were praying. I don't know if they were fasting, but I believe they were seeking the Lord. It took 10 days. 10 days. I don't believe they wavered. I really don't. Because it says they were in one accord, and let's read that and prove it. Acts 2, 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost, that's a feast. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now let's stop right there. I've got a little something there in brackets, as you can see. If it's in brackets and italicized, it's not Bible. It's probably me throwing it in. Tongues in every single case, except one in the book of Acts, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, Every single time, tongues was mentioned, that they spoke in other tongues. The only time that it wasn't mentioned, there was still some sort of evidence. We know that because the people watching were like, oh, 
we can tell those people were just baptized in the Holy Ghost. They didn't use those words, but that's what they were saying, basically. So there was some kind of evidence. It doesn't say it was speaking in other tongues, but it very possibly was. And we'll read that scripture here in just a minute. Number two continues in that same chapter. Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. This has just happened. Here's your backdrop for that scripture. And Peter, the apostle Peter, he was in the upper room. He's now filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. And people thought they were drunk. I left some of that out. You can go read Acts chapter 2. It's really good. People thought they were drunk. And that tells me they weren't just like this. Something was happening in that room that people heard them and were like, uh, something happening in there. I told my mama when I was 19, first time I ever went to a Pentecostal church, I came back to her. She was taking me to college the next morning. And on the ride down there, I probably talked her ear off, telling her everything that happened at that Pentecostal church. I'd never seen such, never been in such. I said, Mama, they're either all crazy or I want it. They got something I want or they're crazy. <laughs> well, guess what? It's what I wanted and my life turned around. So these people were thought to be drunk. And Peter was like, oh, no, no, no. Hey, no, y'all. It's not what you think. We're not drunk. He said, it's like early in the morning. We're not drunk. So then he says this. Some of my favorite words in the Bible. Acts 2, 16 through 18. But this is that. Woo! That's power in those words. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And we repeat here what y'all just read a while ago in the book of Joel. Peter repeats it. Here it is. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and all my servants and all my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I read that fast because we already read it in Joel already. Peter said, this is it, y'all. You've been waiting for this. Your ancestors have heard these prophecies for years. And it's here. It has happened. Can you imagine? What if we're all sitting here? I mean, the wind's blowing tonight. It's a little cool, I know. But what if we were sitting here and we'd been praying? Let's say we'd had a prayer meeting. And all of a sudden, just this hurricane-type wind comes under this tent. And what if I look over there at Casey and there's like fire coming off her head? And, and Brittany back there is just fires like cloven tongues, like as a fire. And all of a sudden, we who speak English start speaking in languages that we never spoken in before. And we don't even know those languages. We never studied them. Y'all be freaked out probably. We would be like freaked out. They rolled with it, man. They're like, this is it. This is what he told us was coming. Such a beautiful beautiful thing that happened in the upper room that day. So Peter's preaching to him. He already told him what we just read. Now let's look at number three. He's still preaching. Acts chapter 2 verses 37 through 39. Now when they heard this, that's all the people that were listening and thought they were drunk and all. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do I'm going to stop. That's desperation. That's not them going, yeah, yeah, I don't know what that is, but they're crazy in there. No, 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 no. They were like, he just preached to us. Peter just preached a sermon and told us that Jesus, that Jesus that was on earth was the Son of God, and, and we killed him. What do we do? What do we do? Now, some people misquote this. I've heard it misquoted since I was 19. People say that the people... Uh, came up and said, what must we do to be saved? That's not what it says. It does not say, what must we do to be saved? It just says, men and brethren, what do we need to do? You just told us we killed the Messiah. What do we do? Here we go. They said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Notice that that receive is that verb lombano, that active one where you get a hold of it. Now look at verse 39. For all the people, not y'all, but everybody who could be watching who says, well I'm not holy enough for that or that's just for really sanctified people or maybe just preachers or Bible scholars. No. Verse 39 proves 
That's not true. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And you've got it right under there. Something y'all all need to know. What does all mean in the Greek? It means all. I mean, it's just that easy. All means all. So if he said that this is a gift for all people, then it is. It's everybody. He says, the promise is unto you, your children, to all that are afar off. Now, I've had people say to me also, trust me, y'all, I've been in this thing a long time. I've had every argument thrown at me. Just oh, Unless there's a new one, y'all throw it tonight. I've had people say, this means it's for y'all right here in Jerusalem and for even people way over yonder in Samaria. Or Jude, it's for all of y'all that are afar off. That word afar off in the Greek can mean distance, but it usually means time. All who are afar off, that means in 2022. That means all through time, this gift is for everybody, even to those that are afar off. And you could have substituted even those who are far from us in time, who are yet to come, which is us, and all through the ages. So this is for everybody, and it's through all time. Now, number four, another reality of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament is in Acts 4.31. The disciples have already been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now they're out preaching. Because what did Jesus say to them in Acts 1? He said, wait till you be endued with the power of the Holy Ghost. Then y'all go be witnesses. Then go do it. So, here they are. They're doing it. They're preaching. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, let's go with that last word right there. When you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you generally are bolder than you were before because the power is just flowing through you and you just can't hardly stand it. You just got to say something. It, you know, it's always good and loving and kind, but you got to say something. But when it says they were filled with the Holy Ghost and you say, wait a minute, I thought that happened back in Acts chapter 2. What, what's that mean? The Holy Ghost infilling, you are continually flowing in that. Like right now, okay, no, let's don't take right now. Let's say I go home tonight and I'm watching who plays ball tonight. Maybe the Yankees or something. I don't know who plays. Let's say I'm watching the ball game. I'm going to still be a good Christian full of the Holy Ghost. But I'm probably not going to be really flowing in the Holy Ghost. You know, I'm going to be watching and going, come on, hit the ball. You know? And But right now, I feel the Holy Ghost flowing through me. I feel it from my fingertips to my toes to my hair. I feel the Holy Ghost flowing through me. Now, when I'm at home on my couch tonight, I still have the Holy Ghost in me. But there are times when you move in an anointing of the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm talking about if you've been baptized. Debbie, I'm going to put you, single you out. When the Lord gives you a word of knowledge or wisdom for somebody and you hear the Lord tell you, go tell somebody something, you know what you feel, right? You feel, oh, that power of the Holy Ghost comes up in you and you know you've got to move on it or else be miserable. If you disobey, and she doesn't, but... I have before. I've disobeyed. Maybe you have. We've disobeyed before. And you don't use, oh, why did I move in the Holy Ghost? So this is what happens here. They'd already received it a while ago, but now they're in a church service, and boy, is it flowing. They're filled with the Holy Ghost, and the place was shaken, and they preach with boldness. All right, let's keep going. Acts uh, chapter 8. This is example number 5. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received, okay, there's received, and it's the word decomai, it's like when you saw me just calmly put the paper in Kayla's hand. They received the word, it says. They've heard somebody preaching, they received it, like we all did when we became Christians. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, verse 15, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive, there's Lombano, a different receive, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 16 is very important. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received, Lombano, the Holy Ghost. 
I'll stop there before I go to what we say in verse 18. The biggest form of pride that I've seen rise up in people all through the years was when you tell them about this baptism of the Holy Ghost and they think you're telling them that they don't have anything. That's not at all what I'm saying. If you're a Christian and you're already converted, yes, you are a saved child of God and the Holy Spirit has already been planted in you. But here, the people had already received the Word of God. The, the calm one received it. They just decamied it. <laughs> but then Peter and John come down to him and say, Have y'all received the, the Holy Ghost since you believe? And there, all that had happened was, uh, I'm going to call that verse out again just so people can see this because somebody at home needs to know this. Acts chapter 8, look at verse 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. But look at what the next thing says. They're baptized. They'd already believed the word, and they weren't just baptized with John's baptism, John the Baptist. They'd been baptized in the name of Jesus already. But yet they had not been baptized in the Holy Ghost. So when I've seen it rise up in people, and they're like, you're trying to tell me I don't have anything. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to tell you that what you have inside of you already, there's more for you in the moving of that spirit in your life. So, and some people say that it was a totally separate thing here because the word fallen, you know, he had not yet fallen upon them. It sounds like something new that's coming from heaven that's got to fall on them. And I've had people say, how could it be inside you if it's got to fall on you? Well, let's look at that word. Words are important. That word fallen is the Greek word epipipto, which does can mean to fall, but it can mean to rush, like to rush through you. It can mean to press upon, like it presses on you. But here's the most important one, take possession of, seize you. So when it says, as of yet, the Holy Ghost had not fallen upon them, it more than likely means here it had not yet taken full possession. It was still sitting in the living room when it wanted to go in the kitchen and the bathroom and everywhere else. It had not taken full possession. It had not yet seized you. Uh, I became a Christian when I was 10. And I believe I really was a Christian. I think I was 10 when I went up in that Billy Graham movie or something. I went up and said, I don't want to follow. I was just weeping, you know, baptize me. They baptized me. And I believe I was a Christian. But when I was 19 and I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, something happened to me that was like night and day. I'm like, oh, oh, this is what they were talking about. I get it now. It didn't mean I didn't have something before. Just like I told you about my mom, I didn't mean she didn't have anything before. Don't go out of here saying I said that. Y'all won't. But I've been accused of that. You're telling me I don't have anything. No, I'm not. But there's more. Do you want, I want more. Yes. If any one of y'all in this room right here, circle 10, came to me and said, prove to you that there's more for you than what you already got, Leslie. I'm going to say, show it to me in that Bible, and if you can prove it, I want it. I'm going after it. But if it's not in the Word, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to reject it. But this is in the Word. It's so clearly in the Word. So, again, these people had been baptized. They were already believers, but they hadn't been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Shows you there's another thing that can happen to you, even after salvation. All right, let's look at the next. Oh, no, 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 before we do, I gave you an example of that word epipipto on your paper. I said it's the same word that was used when John the Baptist's dad, Zacharias, when he was in the temple and the angel appeared, and it says fear fell upon him. That doesn't mean fear came out of the sky and landed on him. It means fear rose up in him. <gasps> you know when fear rises up in you? It's the same word, epipipto, fell. It means it rushed through you. It overwhelmed you. Uh, let's see. Okay. Man, Brother Bob, my old preacher, he said, I done gone to meddling. Well, I might be going to meddling here, but I got to say this. I have a lot of people who have argued with me, well, you're not saved till you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost and you've spoken in other tongues. I disagree. As you know, I disagree. I don't think for a second that if there's one of you here that's decided to follow Jesus and you're following him, but you've not yet been baptized in the Holy Ghost with the uh, evidence of speaking in other tongues, I don't believe that you're not saved. And this verse sort of helps me prove that because 
Do you notice who was preaching to these people who received the word and got baptized in the name of Jesus? It says that Philip had gone to preach to them, but then Philip left. Now, if these people weren't saved, remember, they're not baptized in the Holy Ghost yet. And if Philip left them and they weren't yet baptized in the Holy Ghost and we say they're not saved, that's a dangerous thing for him to just leave them. That tells me that, yes, they were saved. Or he would have stayed right there with them and said, all right, y'all, until you receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you can't go to heaven. You're still doomed to hell. So I got to stay here with you. He didn't do that. He left. And then Peter and John heard, hey, those people down there received the word. They got saved. Let's go down there and tell them about the Holy Ghost. And, you know, they did. Does that make sense? To me, that's so clearly. That would have been a dangerous thing if it was a heaven or hell issue here that you speak in other tongues or whatever. Philip wouldn't have left them. Uh-uh-uh. All right. All right. Let's go to example number six. Acts chapter 10, 44 through 47. Your backdrop for this. The Jews so far are the ones who've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, unless there's a Jew in this place that I don't know about, and if it is, great, I love Jews. I'm a Gentile. I don't have Jewish blood except a teeny bit, not enough to really count, I guess. But if it does, sorry, Lord, I mean, I'm proud of it. But the Gentiles, SS non-Jews, the Jews didn't think that this Holy Ghost and stuff was for them. They thought it was just for us Jews. You know, they had always thought we're God's chosen people, and they were. But now God's got a plan. He's going to pour this gift out on everybody who wants it. Because didn't we just read in the book of Joel where the prophet Joel said, it's going to be for everybody, all flesh. So Peter has an angel come to him basically saying, go down there to those Gentiles. They've been praying. Go preach to the Gentiles. And he's like, uh-uh, uh-uh. Not me. They're unclean. God said, don't you call what I've cleansed, common or unclean. You go down there and preach to them. I'm paraphrasing. So Peter goes down to preach to this whole house full of Gentiles that he would have seen as heathens, basically. He's preaching to heathens in his mind, not God's. So here we go. Peter's preaching to them. Verse 44, when Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed, that means the Jews, they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and not, hang on a second, yeah, heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received, lombano, the active verb, the Holy Ghost as well as we. Now Peter's preaching to him because God told him to. He did it a little bit reluctantly at first. But when he's preaching to him, the Holy Ghost starts moving in them. Why? Because they're receiving the word. They're decomai, that passive receiving. They've received the word and they're believing it. And so when that happens, the next thing is the Holy Ghost they received the Holy Ghost, and Peter's astonished. And he's taking people down there with him, and he's going, you know, like, uh, uh, did we expect this? But hey, it happened. And how can we forbid? we got to baptize them in water now, because how can we forbid that? They've been baptized in the Holy Ghost just like we were back in, he didn't say Acts chapter 2, but like back in <laughs> Acts chapter 2. Now, here's where I'm going to stop just a minute and tell you, notice it said... Peter said the Holy Ghost fell on them. How did he know that? They spoke with tongues. And what else does it say? Did I put it in there? Did I not put that whole verse? What does it say they did? Yeah, I thought I had it in there. They began to speak in other tongues and magnify God. It didn't say that they raised a hand and Peter said, Oh, look, they got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> or they just went like, Woo! And he said, Oh, they got it. No, it was something else that happened, something they couldn't deny. Like, anybody can do that. A Satanist can come under here and try to fool y'all and go like that. A Satanist can take off running and act like it's the Holy Ghost and it not be. But it's very, very hard to counterfeit the speaking in other tongues. Can Satan counterfeit things? I believe he can. But when it's a Christian who's asked for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's not a counterfeit. God's not going to give you a stone when you ask for bread. 
Now is when I'm going to refer back to something earlier. Remember when I told you that in every instance except one, it mentions speaking in tongues. The one that it didn't was the one I read right before this. When Philip went down and preached to them, they received the word. And then Peter and John went down and said, uh, uh, you know, they said, we've just been baptized in Jesus. And he said, oh, prayed for them. They received the Holy Ghost. It doesn't say they spoke in other tongues. But I skipped over the part where it says in verse 18 that Simon, who was a sorcerer. Am I right? Wasn't Simon a sorcerer? Simon the sorcerer is watching. And when they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, something happened because he was watching and saw evidence. And when he saw the evidence, he said, I want that power. I want that power that whoever I lay hands on is going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. He offered him money for it. Mm -hmm. what, what is it going to take? I want the same power. And they said, uh-uh, uh-uh. This is not to be bought with money. So I brought that up to say it doesn't say that those people that Peter and John prayed over spoke in other tongues, but there was some kind of visible evidence that Simon saw and was like, whoa, wow. So, anyhow, in Acts chapter 10, what I just read you, it does say they spoke in other tongues. Let's go to, if, uh, let's see, example number 7 is Acts 11, 15 through 16. This is Peter retelling the story. What you just read in Acts chapter 10, he goes and retells it. He says, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So Peter's retelling the story like, y'all, it fell on them like it did on us. Speaking in tongues and everything, basically. Now, uh, this is still right under number 7. You see where I've got Acts 11.1? 1. It says, And the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received Decomai, the calm one, the word of God. Acts 17, 1, which you can read at home, uses the same receive. I'm just trying to show you the differences in the receives. It matters. All right, final page. What time are, are we, have we got, y'all? 7.56. Oh, we're great. We're going to go a little longer. Last page. Number 8, Acts 19, 1 through 6. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, he's a Bible teacher, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have you received Lombano? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto, then, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John truly baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Again, you've got an evidence there. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. It wasn't just like, you know, all right, receive you the Holy Ghost. All right, we're good. Let's go on home. No, something happened. When they laid hands on them or whatever, there was some evidence. It wasn't just like, okay, good. You're good, girl. Go home. It was like something happened there. And I think that is so key to understanding this. All right. Um, the word came there in verse 6 where it says the Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke with tongues. The word came there is the Greek word erkomai, which means to make one's appearance, to come before the public, to show itself, to be established, to become known. That verb clearly shows you there's some evidence. It was made known. It wasn't just, okay, in faith, we believe you're good, you got it. There was some evidence because it became made public, it says there. All right, let's keep going. Number nine, Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is a clear evidence that the Holy Ghost is so good for us Christians. Why would we want to say that it's not for us anymore? A lot of a lot of churches, um, especially those of the cessationists, did I say that right? Cessationist movement, believe that it ceased. 
cessation comes from cease. They believe it ceased. It's not for us anymore. That we've moved beyond this. That it's, we don't need it anymore. What? Is anybody in, under this tent? I hope y'all can answer yes to this. I cannot. Is anybody under this tent moving in the power and the anointing of Peter and Paul and the apostles? I've not yet seen the dead raised, but I believe I'm going to. In other words, I'm not moving yet in what they were moving in. And it was necessary for them to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. But now we say, no, we've moved beyond that. Have we? No, we haven't. And we're going to talk in a minute about how nowhere in the Bible does it say that this baptism of the Holy Ghost was ceased. It's over. We don't need that anymore. Nowhere. So, when we see this that I just read you in Romans 8, the Spirit helps your infirmities, your weaknesses. It helps them. Because you may not know how to pray. You ever had a day you just feel like, I just don't feel right. Something just don't feel right. Mentally. I was fought with that this morning. I told Alan, I just feel like crying. I don't know why. I, I'm such a happy person. It's like something was trying to attack me. I felt it about this class tonight. I could feel it. And I, I didn't know what to say. Dude, how do I pray? I don't know what it is. Do you know what I did? I prayed in the Spirit. I began to pray in other tongues because I didn't know how to make the groanings here. I didn't know how to, not the groanings, the groanings is what the Holy Ghost does. I didn't know how to make an utterance of what was wrong because I didn't know what was wrong. But I began to pray in the Spirit because the Spirit that's in me knows exactly what was wrong. And that Spirit began to make intercession with the Father there. And you know what? It left me. It disappeared. Of course, I had other people. I had some of y'all praying for me. It left. But you pray in the Spirit to make intercession for things. I had the same thing happen last night, and I was like, why am I dealing with these, like, just thoughts? Like, I mean, not like, go do something bad, but just, like, repetitive, negative thoughts. And I was like, I haven't dealt with this in a really long time. Like, where is it coming from? And I was just confused. Like, Lord, I haven't opened a door to this. What is this? I don't even know. Like, I was just confused. Like, where is this coming from? Um... So I prayed in the spirit a little bit and then just just forgot. And as I was in the middle of doing something, all of a sudden I knew. I knew a specific, I knew what the specific spirit was that was tormenting my mind and that I was giving audience to. As soon as I knew that, I said, spirit of rejection, get out of my mind. Go in Jesus' name. And when it did, it was like complete joy, complete freedom. Praise God. But it simply came from praying in the spirit and then just going about my business. And suddenly I knew it's that simple. But, like, I could have just kept entertaining that all night, and then the next day, and then the next day until it turned into a depression or what, whatever. Yes. But I'm saying the spirit, sometimes it's that specific. Like, I knew, call this specific thing out and tell it to leave your mind. And it was gone. Completely. Another great testimony of how the spirit was making intercession for her infirmities, the weaknesses she was going through. And then it spoke a mystery to her and told her just exactly what it was. We're going to talk about that mystery here in just a second, too. And if anybody at any time, I know it's already after 8, probably, if anybody needs to go to the bathroom, take a break, whatever, help yourself. And come on right back if you can. Number 10. I'm not going to talk about this very much. 1 Corinthians 12, read it sometime, tells about the various gifts of the Spirit. One of those gifts is the gift of tongues. That is not what happens to you when you start when you're baptized in the spirit that's your prayer language you and the lord the gift of tongues is something that's used in a church service to give a message to the whole church like for example alan stands up and i'm up here preaching but alan stands up and starts speaking in tongues really loudly and we all get really quiet and we listen because we know god's got a message through that right there and then when he's done somebody interprets if nobody interprets it's out of order We're, we'll talk that's next week's lesson and I'm trying to tell you here, go ahead and look over 1 Corinthians 12 this week if you can and read about the different giftings of the Spirit. All right, here we go. 11. Number 11, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 4. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. I'm going to stop right there. I want you to, that goes with what Megan said. Perfect timing, Meg. Look underneath that where I've got some little dashes to tell you what the words mean. Mysteries here. Paul said, this is the Apostle Paul, who said, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. What is mysteries? It's religious secrets. 
confided only to the initiated and not to ordinary mortals. It's a hidden or secret thing that is not obvious to the understanding. When you're baptized in the Holy Ghost and you're praying in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost through you is praying mysteries. It's praying secrets that normal people can't know. That's why I, like, I keep using Debbie. When she has a word from God, like a word of wisdom or knowledge, and she comes to you and she tells you something that she couldn't have known but by the Holy Ghost. Because that mystery was revealed to her by the Holy Ghost. It's a mystery. Um, it's, like, it's like you're in a club. I don't like that. I don't like a clicky thing because the Holy Ghost is for everybody. But when it's said here that it's like for the initiated, it means it's for those who are who know him and are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Those initiated people can speak those mysteries and it brings understanding that you wouldn't have known. She wouldn't have known it was a spirit of rejection. And I kept thinking in my mind, trying to figure it out. Like if I just keep trying to figure it out like it's a puzzle, I'll figure it out. But the thing is, you will not figure it out mentally. Anybody who's dealt with mental health issues knows you can try all day long to get out of that cycle that goes around in your brain there, there will just be always be another problem to unravel at the end of that. Absolutely. But when the spirit tells you, Ooh. it doesn't require you to try to figure it out. It's Hallelujah. not a human solution. I think that's why it's. It's not like you're. I'm some special initiated person. It's that. It's information I could have never gotten to naturally. Yes. Because it's something happening in the spirit world. Because, you know, I'm not getting kooky or anything, but. Bible clearly tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Says it. We're wrestling against. There's another world that we can't see that's, that's right. interacting with ours. And like she said, the Bible clearly explains that. It's true. It's not kooky. It's true. Right. I'm going to pick it back up with verse 3 here in number 11. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. So... When you speak in other tongues, you're edifying yourself. What does that mean? Look below it, and I didn't make this stuff up. I looked it up in the Greek. In this case, it is definitely Greek, New Testament. Edify means to build up. Who wants to be built up? I do. Yes. It says to promote growth in Christian wisdom, affection, grace, virtue, holiness, blessedness. To grow in wisdom and piety, to give strength and courage. Y'all, when y'all read that, don't you need that? I need every bit of that. I want to grow in grace and wisdom and love and all of it. And it says that when you pray in other tongues, you're being edified. This stuff is being developed in you. You're building yourself up. You're not doing it. The Lord is through you. Now, if I leave you hanging right there and you go, wait a minute. It plainly says that when you speak in tongues, it's just for you. You're just edifying yourself. But that people who prophesy in church is edifying the whole church. Well, next week we're going to talk about how when the gift of tongues is used in a church service and it's interpreted, remember they got to go hand in hand, the Bible says that's equal to prophecy. It says that prophecy is the biggest thing. Everybody should desire to prophesy, he said. But he said, if somebody speaks in tongues and interprets, okay, that's kind of like prophecy because we know what he said or what she said. But next week, more for that. All right, let's keep going. Number 12 is 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. I've prayed in the spirit sometimes and had a, had a pretty good idea of what it was about. Not always. And that's okay. I don't need to, as long as he knows. But sometimes I have an idea, but usually it's not that I know word for word what I'm saying. So your understanding is not fruitful. That's okay. And I'll tell you now that if you've not been baptized in the Holy Ghost and you want to receive, whether it be tonight or at home in your basement floor or wherever Logan was when she received, you know, it could be anywhere. But if, if you want that gifting wherever you are, just know that it doesn't matter that you don't know what you're saying. I've had people say, but I don't want to just say something that I don't know what it means. You're not supposed to know what it means necessarily. He knows. If you, knew, uh, if you knew what to pray, you'd have prayed in the first place, you know. Let him do it. That's the key. All right, let's keep going. 14. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 28. No, I skipped one, didn't I? Let's go to 13. 
1 Corinthians 14, 18. I chuckle about this every year or whenever I teach this. I hadn't taught this in three years and I repented of that. If I, Paul said this, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. It almost, and then he was, Lord, he wasn't, but it sounds like Paul's bragging a little bit. I was like, you know, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all y'all do. He wasn't doing that, I don't believe. I believe he was trying to say that even though he's telling y'all prophecy is kind of more important unless you interpret. He said, I'm, I'm not saying tongues is not important. He said, I'm, I'm speaking tongues more than all of y'all. So he's trying to emphasize to you it is important because I do it more than all of you probably. So I, that's cute to me. Oh, Paul. <laughs> All right, now we go to number 14. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 28. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now, the reason I put that in there is because I have had people who have come here who don't go to this church, but they've come to the same class you're sitting in. And they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Then they go back to their church where it's not taught, it's not believed, it's not allowed. Um... I had one who went back to a church where it, it was believed, but they didn't really preach it. Thought it would cause trouble, you know, or chaos. Not true. But that person was worshiping at the altar one day and started speaking in tongues. Not loud. Not like, boy, I'm speaking in tongues. But just between them and God, you know. And they, somebody came to them and said, uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not allowed in here unless somebody comes and interprets. The person who told them that just didn't understand. The gift of tongues, when it's in operation, you know it. Because it takes over everything. Everybody has to get real quiet because that tongue is loud and forceful and speaking a message to the church. And you kind of get quiet because you're like, oh, this is it. This is God. Let's listen. But when you're just praying around the, uh, like for example, Belinda comes up here on Sunday mornings and is leading worship now up here. Heather came up with her the other day. And I can hear him speaking in tongues. I was up here. I could hear them. They weren't out of order. They weren't taking over the service. I was still able to sing, and we were preaching. They didn't take over anything. If it, it, if it does take over, it's got to be interpreted. And I've had that happen. You know, if it happens, then you got to correct it and say, hey, you know, it wasn't exactly right that time, but don't give up. Hey, keep seeking the Lord. You don't kick them out of church because they're out of order. <laughs> All right. Almost done here. Number 15. 1 Corinthians 1439. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and what? Oh my goodness. Look at that next line. Do not forbid to speak with tongues. Don't forbid it. How can anybody read that in a church and say, we're not doing that here. We don't do that here. Paul told them, don't y'all forbid it. Do not. That's powerful language right there. I would be in disobedience if I did not allow speaking in other tongues in this church. Paul knew it was coming. You know he did. He knew as the ages rolled by, the devil was going to try to rob this gift out of the church, and people would start saying, nah, I hear you. That's beautiful. <laughs> people would say, we don't need that here, but we do. And the last few. Number 16, Ephesians 6:18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So y'all, you're not just at church when you pray in tongues. You're not. You're brushing your teeth sometimes. You know, you feel the Holy Ghost hit you and just start speaking in other tongues. You're driving down the road. Kay loves playing a song you love. And you just, no, don't lift your hand. Wait a minute, go like that. So yeah, you still got your hands on the steering wheel. But you just start speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And it's a beautiful thing. Just let the Spirit speak through you. Now, I do not, I'm not being funny here. I really mean this. I don't think uh, Alan should go to work on third shift tonight and just start going around to all his workers and speaking in other tongues because they're going to be like, what did he say? I don't know what he said. Paul said it'd be better for me to speak, you know, with the understanding than to speak a whole lot in the Spirit if, if it's at that time called for. So, no, you're not going to go to work and just start talking to everybody in tongues. I've seen people do that. Like, they think it makes them holy if everybody hears them speaking in tongues. No, that's not what it's about. In your private prayer time, 
speak in tongues all you want. But I will say, say this, I think some people also have a misconception that you have to wait for the Spirit to get you to pray say in it, tongues. Meg. That's really only something you see with like new people who are new to it because maybe they don't know how to flow into it yet. But as you get into it, like, I'm not going to do it because I think it's disrespectful. But sure. I could just, I could do it right now. I'd just be praying in tongues whenever I want to, wherever I want to. It's not like you wait for something to hit you. Right. Because you're in unity with him. That word lambano is also used when a man takes a wife. So yes. it's just, um, it's used in the New Testament when he like takes a wife in marriage. So it's like you are in unity with him. So yeah. like I don't, I don't have to like wait and wait for something to overpower me. You just, I could do it right now, wherever I want to. Yeah. That becomes easier the more you flow in it. But I just wanted to throw that out because yeah. I know a lot of people who have been baptized in the spirit, the way they talk about it, it's clear to me that they still don't quite understand it because it's like, well, the spirit came over me the other day and I spoke in tongues and I'm like, that's awesome. But like, you can do it anytime, anywhere as you learn how to flow in it. Absolutely. And if you're not yet, it'll come if you oh, yeah. know that you can expect that. Great point. Because I said you're brushing your teeth and the Holy Ghost hits you. That doesn't mean that's, that's why I said it because yeah, you yeah, said yeah. that. I that's just want to clarify. Yes, thank you. That's not the only time. And that might happen. But maybe yes. spit out the toothpaste first. <laughs> and then, you know. I said that because I play my Christian music on Sunday mornings when I'm getting ready. And it'll be playing. I'll be brushing my teeth. I'm like, oh, yes. And sometimes it doesn't hit you like that. And you're like, but you always have a choice not, you know. Holy Ghost. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. You have free will, too. All right. Uh, 17. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Quench not the Spirit. For churches that are not allowing the gifts of the Spirit to operate, I'm going to have to be blunt. I love them all. I'm not mad at them. I'm not judging. As a, as a pastor, I have to discern what thus saith the Lord. And if the Lord says right here, don't quench the Spirit, and we have churches that don't allow the moving of the Spirit, they're quenching the Spirit. I've done it myself and didn't realize later, oh, man, I feel like I kind of put a damper on that. I repent. I don't ever want to quench the spirit. And if you wonder on this last one, number 18, you say, Jude's got 20 chapters. No, it's only got one chapter, so it's only got a verse 20. That's why it says Jude 20, but I should have put a one. Sorry. So Jude one twenty says this, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. When, when y'all hear me say something like, I was praying in the Spirit last week, that means I'm speaking in other tongues. I'm praying in the Spirit. And he says here that you're building yourself up in faith when you do that, which I think is beautiful. And um, at the very end, the verse that some people will use to tell you that speaking in other tongues is not for today, here it is. Famous verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we'll start with verse 8. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. I have had many people tell me that that's the verse that says that speaking in tongues is no more, because it says tongues will cease. Well, what's the next? Did y'all see what it said right after that? It said knowledge will vanish away. Knowledge hasn't gone anywhere. So why are we where? Why are we taking that one little thing? It's because we don't want to deal with it. We take that one little thing and say, well, this is over. Oh, but knowledge? No, we're still good with knowledge. We still need that. It's all still here. It's all still here. You can't say that it ceased. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it ceased. Paul said, don't forbid it. Don't quench it. Um, I think I'm going to buy, I'm not going to tell you the name of the book, because I, I don't know, well, maybe I should. No, I'm not. I'm going to buy this book written by this cessationist preacher who says why he thinks it was supposed to stop. And I'm going to read it. And I'm going to ask God to give me wisdom in the sermon when I read it. I'm, I know good and well I'm not going to agree with him because the Word of God goes against that. But I, I want to know why they say what they say. Does anybody have any questions? I'm done. Does anybody have anything to ask or say next week's Bible study will continue with this more about what speaking in other tongues does for you and how it should be used and how it is not the gift of tongues used in a church service. Let's do it. I just kind of thought about something I've never really thought about before. You, know, you were talking about some of these verses that talks about edifying yourself and building yourself up in faith. 
we all can quote, you know, the verse, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we know, like, the written word of God. Oh. But it says in John, when he's talking about the spirit coming, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. It says that the spirit hears directly from the Father. Yes. And then gives us that information. Ooh, I feel that. So when you're praying in the spirit, you are speaking the words of God Ooh. because the spirit is speaking God's words. It's speaking directly from the Father. So... Even if you don't understand what you're saying, that also is a form of speaking the word of God. So you're building yourself up in faith when you're speaking out loud, when you're hearing the word of God spoken. Even if you don't understand it in tongues, it's the word of God speaking through you. So, so faith is coming yeah. by hearing the word of God spoken. Yeah. Even if you don't understand it, it's him speaking. Yes. I never thought about it that it's way so before. good. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you speak in other tongues, it's God speaking through you. It is the word of God. I mean, it's your tongue. It's your mouth. You know, it's not going to sound like what I do. Or, but it's him taking control. We watch this um, news. I should send you all the link. We watch this ABC News uh, study, story, something. We watched it here at the church. Where they um, hooked people up to brain electrodes. They hooked people up and they saw what happened to the front part of the brain that is, controls you thinking about what you say. And they hooked people up who are just talking like me and you. And man, the front part of the brain was going, you know. Then they hooked up some Franciscan monks or something who chant. I don't know what they chant in Latin or something, maybe. I don't know. But they were chanting and they hooked them up. Still, this front part of the brain was just active. But when they took people and they were speaking in other tongues, the front part of the brain went quiet. And we saw it. It was ABC News, y'all. And we watched it, and they showed the scientists. The scientists who did this weren't like Pentecostal preachers trying to prove a point. They were just scientists. And when they saw that, they were like, you know, scratch the old head going, huh. Because it was, it was like Harvard or somewhere, like a reputable. Some big, like, yeah. Yeah, some big university yeah. that did the study. Might have been Johns Hopkins. It was somebody big yeah. like that. So it proved that when people were speaking in other tongues and they say, it's not us, it's him, it really wasn't them. The brain shut down right here. Woo. And if you want to, uh, me too, Blake, I was like, well, that got me. And if, if you don't want the devil to know what you're saying, pray in the spirit. He cannot. It's a secret weapon, y'all. If we were in the army, we would be saying to our commanders, give us every secret weapon you got to go against the enemy. Well, the Holy Ghost, of course. I'm going to end it with this, or maybe not. The, of course the devil's going to say something like, I've got, it's like the Grinch. I must stop Christmas from coming. You know, The devil's like, I must stop the church from moving in power. So if I take away what they believe about the Holy Ghost, they won't be speaking in tongues anymore, and I'll know everything they say. They won't be able to fool me anymore. Because when you speak in tongues, he does not know what you're saying. Can you imagine how frustrated that old joker is? When he hears you speaking in tongues, so he's like, oh, I don't know what you're saying. I see why he, I see why he tried to fool the church and take it right on out. Logic, he used logic. I'm not giving him any glory. He just used logic. Anybody else have anything else to say or ask about it? I, I mean, um, when you were talking about how Simon was wanting the power and he just wanted it just to, for his own glory, um, we watched the Landon showed me the Bible A B where I was actually able to visualize that whenever you were saying. Oh, that. was it in there? Oh there? Yeah. And so he goes and says, you know, he gives Peter the money and he says, I want it. You know, um, it's not working right. Give give me the what you got. Yeah. Yeah. And Peter's like he throws him the money back and he says, How dare you? Like what do you think that God can be bought? No. And he was like, uh, and then God just comes and he's like basically I don't know how to say it like killing sure. the man um, because he, he sinned and um, Peter prayed for him and said God please forgive him like he does not know what he's doing and so because Peter asked him to forgive him and everything like he the man left but it's just when you said that, like, that visual came to my mind, and I was just like, wow. Because <laughs> you actually saw that. And I can't remember how it all happened. I can't remember if all that, 
my girl, I look at my girls because we study the book of Acts so much. Can't remember how it all happened, but yeah, I mean, Peter, we got to know sometimes that people don't know, they don't know what they're saying. They don't. And when people come against you or you or whoever's going to talk about the Holy Ghost and they say something, they, they don't know what they're talking about sometimes because nobody's taught them. Yeah. I can't get mad at them because nobody's taught them. Simon was, you know, he wanted, he wanted that power. People don't know. But if we don't tell them, they're not going to know. we got to tell them. You're going to have some people that look at you and go like, mm -mm. I ain't going down there to the well if that's what y'all believe. Mm -mm. But you're going to have some who are hungry. And they're going to say, I yes, want it. that want to see Christ. They want it, yes. Any more questions? Even ask questions. Or... I mean, were you guys afraid when you first, I mean... Was I afraid, like when I received? Yeah, like when you heard yourself talking. I was more, I was more amazed. I was like, <gasps> I was thinking something just came out of me that wasn't me. I didn't, I didn't say that. And um, I used to have this uh, preacher who would come to our church and preach. Emily Dotson was her name. She's still alive in her 90s, I think. She uh, would tell people, quit trying to think. And Miss Dotson, she was, she was getting older, so she you know it seems like when we get older, we can kind of be bolder and say what we she'd be like quit trying to think i see you trying to pray for the holy ghost and you trying to think of what to say uh lord uh thank you jesus and and i'm glad you did this yesterday lord and let's see you're trying to think that's natural you know you're not i'm not making fun of anybody who does i did it but miss dawson would say she'd just tell him quit trying to think you're trying to think too much and she'd tell him just say hallelujah because hallelujah is Hebrew already. She'd say, you're already speaking a foreign language when you say hallelujah. She'd say, so that you won't sit and try to think of what I'm going to say next, just say hallelujah. Make it easy. You know, she was just the cutest little thing. And she'd tell us to do that, you know. And I did see a lot of success, you know, when she would pray over people like that. Because she would tell them, quit, turn your brain off. Quit thinking. And sometimes when you're praying for the Holy Ghost to receive that baptism for the first time, You'll feel your mouth start trembling a little. And then sometimes you'll feel your tongue almost start like trembling a little or getting heavy, some say. I didn't feel a heaviness. It'll start to tremble a little, and you're like, well, I can't hardly say hallelujah anymore because my tongue don't go wrong. Let it go. Whatever sound comes out, I mean, here's a mommy with beautiful little children here. When they started talking, they weren't saying, hi, mom, could you get me some juice? <laughs> they weren't. When those kids started talking, it was probably like, dad, dad, mama, you know, because they were speaking syllables. Sometimes when you first speak in tongues, it's just some syllables coming out because you, you, you've never done this before and you, you don't know how to yield. You're not doing it, but you have to yield. So your tongue starts, and I've seen people, they're going, glory to God. Hall I'm not making fun of them. Mark my words. But they're going, hallelujah, glory to God. Uh, uh, hallelujah. It's like, no. As soon as they feel their tongues start trying to do something else, like, like la, 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 or they stop. Don't stop. Let that sound come out. And it will turn into a language, just like they, theirs turned into a language as they grew. <laughs> he's there going, that's right, brother. Hey, he's not too young. Children are not too young to receive the Holy Ghost. Something that hit me tonight, and that's why I was on my phone when you were talking about Lombano, and I wasn't trying to be disrespectful, but I just I needed to see something in the Greek, so I pulled up the app on my phone. When you're talking about that active word Lombano, it's all it was also the word that they used when they would talk about somebody receiving wages or somebody receiving the punishment that was due to them. Huh. And so what struck me was that it's the possession of something that is rightfully yours. Oh, yeah. And so with the spirit, people say, well, I don't know if it's for me. It might be for certain holy people or, you know, it's just not for me. No, they specifically use that verb, yes, because it's an active word, but also because it's for you. That's good. And what one of us, if we're struggling to pay our bills, for example, but we knew we had access to a bank account with unlimited resources that would never run dry, but we're struggling to pay our bills, we can't afford to feed our family we're going to lose our house one of us would just sit there and never tap into that right even though it's rightfully ours wow that's good so i'm thinking we want to be built up we're all struggling with different things in this life and this is a great unlimited resource we can tap into 
to get answers to prayers that we need to make a difference in this world. How many of us have friends who are, we've had friends who have committed suicide or died of cancer or whatever. We have this unlimited resource of power in prayer, power in action. Ooh, yes. And it's ours, but the devil has just tried to trick us into thinking that it's for a select few or whatever. But that was the whole difference between the Old Testament and the New. The Old Testament, you saw it on specific people who had a great task to accomplish. Right. But then they said, but there's going to come a day when it's for everybody, which tells me that we all have a great task to accomplish. Yes. Because we all need that empowerment. Yes. Everybody. So it's for you. Ooh, praise it's God. your, it's a gift. It's not that we earned it, but it's. It's due to us because he promised it to us. It's a gift. He promised it to us. So it's ours. It is. And and I will uh, come against another false teaching. I, I was in a church for years that taught that until you spoke in other tongues, you didn't have anything. That's not true. That is not true. So the people who would go to the altar, I was one of them. I went to the altar every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night for months asking God to baptize me in the Holy Ghost, baptize me in the Holy Ghost because I had been taught that I didn't have anything until that happened. So I literally thought, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. That's not a bad word. I'm not cussing. I mean, the literal place. I was thinking, I guess I'm going to hell till I do this. And I was just in panic mode for months. And when I realized what I've taught you tonight, that when you're saved, the Holy Ghost is already in you. All you have to do is just yield to let him totally just come on out and take full possession. So when you know you already have something, it makes a whole world of difference right here. So when I started preaching it that way and knowing that that's what the word really says, people just started receiving like that, like that, like that. And after we had come to one at Cove and people just were receiving, because you're saved, you already got the Holy Ghost. All you got to do is let it baptize you. When I started preaching it like that, it just became so easy. I went back and watched a video from another church I used to fellowship with far from here. And I saw a lady who had been praying for the Holy Ghost like 12 years ago at my church. She was still going to the altar every service praying and begging God to fill her with the Holy Ghost. It had not happened yet. Why? Because in her mind she was still thinking, I don't have anything and I'm hoping he'll go ahead and give me something. No, no, no. If somebody could have talked to that girl, I wish I should have gone to find her. I should have gone to her and said, girl, you, you have got him in you. Now you just let him flow on out. It would have happened like that. I pray to God she's not still going to the altar seeking the Holy Spirit or not. But I had to clarify that because that's a teaching out there that is damaging to people. Anybody else? And we can pray. Uh, if you want to receive the Holy Ghost, again, you need to be a Christian. If you are a Christian, you've made that move to follow Jesus. And you want to receive the baptism, you can receive it tonight right here. You can receive it on the drive home. You can receive it at home in your, where are you in the basement? Did I make that up? Yes, she really was in the basement. <laughs> I prayed with one lady here one time, and she was in a hurry. She had an appointment, but she really wanted to receive. And she was so <laughs> close. She, you could see her about to yield. She'd be like, hallelujah. I'm like, come on, girl. Come on, just come on. Just yield. And then, but then she had to go. She called me 20 minutes later. She said, it happened. I was running down the road to my appointment. I just started speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So it doesn't have to be here, but it can be. So... If you don't have any more questions or anything, I'm going to ask Megan just to play some music. If you got to go, I understand. I apologize to you that we went over 8 o'clock. I was trying to get it in by 8 so it wouldn't get dark on y'all. <laughs>